All right, good afternoon. Uh, the Secretary General is in Turkmenistan, where earlier today participated in a high-level dialogue on implementing the UN global counterterrorism strategy in Central Asia. He highlighted the acute and growing regional threat posed by terrorism and violent extremism in the region, with extremist organizations actively seeking to recruit citizens of Central Asia. He stressed that as the threat of violent extremism grows around the world, it is critical to ensure that attempts to prevent or curtail violent extremism do not backfire. That means that we need policies that are not just only strong, but smart, the Secretary General said, adding that policies that limit human rights only end up alienating religious and ethnic communities who would normally have a very strong interest in fighting extremism. There's also a press release from our colleagues at the Counterterrorism Implementation Task Force Office for more details about the declaration adopted today and the conclusion of the high-level uh, dialogue in Ashgabat. The Assistant Secretary General for Rule of Law and Security Institutions in DPKO, Alexander Zuev, just briefed the Security Council on mine action. In his remarks, he said that the threats posed by landmines, explosives, remnants of war, and improvised explosive devices exacerbate humanitarian crises and hinder emergency responses. Mr. Zwerf said that mine action is achieving results in the most difficult operating environment, including Iraq, Mali, and South Sudan, and added that the strong leadership and coordination role of the United Nations Mine Action Service underpins and advances these achievements. His remarks are available online. This was the first Security Council debate on mine action since 1996. Good fact. Um, turning to the Ukraine, the latest human rights report on Ukraine says that the parties in the conflict in the country's east have repeatedly failed to implement ceasefire agreements, allowing hostilities to escalate and claim more lives as the fighting entered its fourth year. Covering the period from February 16th to May 15th, the new report reported 36 deaths, 157 injuries, a nearly 50% increase from the previous reporting period. It also says that from the start of the conflict in April 2014, more than 10,000 people have been killed, stressing that these are conservative estimates. More than 1.6 million people have been forced to flee their homes. The report also finds that the socioeconomic deprivation in the east of the country has been deepening. And our humanitarian colleagues say that the conflict continues to detrimentally impact the lives of millions of people in the eastern Ukraine. The shelling in Donetsk last month affected more than 70,000 people with the hospital, homes, and schools sustaining damage. The UN and its partners have stepped up their responses and efforts support to authorities by providing construction materials and other items. You can find both the latest human rights report and the latest humanitarian bulletin online. And our colleagues at UNHCR today said they're extremely concerned by the outbreak of food poisoning in a camp housing thousands of people who have fled fighting in Iraq's Mosul area. Um, UNHCR staff members have been working with other aid agencies and authorities to help the sick recover swift, uh, get swift medical treatment, and extra clean water is being provided in the camps. UNHCR says it is waiting for police investigation to understand the claim, the chain of events, and draw lessons from this tragic incident, which will allow agencies to reinforce public health protocols and prevent such situations in the future. And our colleagues at WFP said they urgently need $172 million for their operation in northeast Nigeria as the lean season begins, driving up food prices and depleting the meager resources of people affected by conflict and int intensifying hunger. The hardest hit areas of Borno, Adamawa, and Yobe are estimated 5.2 million people are hungry, where more than one third of them are on the brink of famine and tens of thousands are experiencing either outright famine or something very close to it. A funding shortfall has been forced WFP to suspend plans to ramp up assistance during the June-August lean season. They now plan to reach only 1.36 million people monthly during the critical period, down from a previous target of 1.8 million. Even those receiving food, nutrition, cash assistance are getting less of it. WFP is held, helping only the very hungriest and most vulnerable. This is a brutal form of triage, but the agency says, given adequate resources, it could do much more. 
more information online as well. And WFP also says that unless funding quickly arrives, it will be forced to suspend its voucher food assistance in July for nearly 150,000 residents of Gaza and the West Bank, the majority of whom are women and children. At the same time, a, major, a major energy crisis is affecting the impoverished Gaza Strip. WFP urgently requires $6.6 .6 million to provide food assistance through vouchers for the next three months to the poorest non-refugee families in Gaza and the West Bank. A disruption of WFP assistance could further undermine food security and deepen the dire living conditions of the poorest families, most of whom live on less than $3.20 a day. And our humanitarian colleagues tell us that participants in a joint UNA-African Union mission wrapped up their Horn of Africa tour in Nairobi today with financial pledges to support the humanitarian response in the drought-hit region. During the trip, participants met with government representatives, local authorities, and humanitarian partners in Ethiopia, Somalia, and Kenya, and also they met with impacted communities. Ahmed al Miraki, the humanitarian envoy of the Secretary General, said the communities they visited in Somalia and Ethiopia expressed a deep and desire to build their own resilience and not to rely on aid efforts indefinitely. <clears throat> And in Geneva, more than 2,500 information and communication technology experts, advocates from around the world and the uh, around the globe are taking part in this week's World Summit on the Information Society. This year's forum will focus on sustainable development trends and inclusive ICT initiatives in areas such as health, education, gender empowerment, the environment, infrastructure, and innovation. More information from the ITU. And our colleagues at UNHCR today announced a joint campaign with the Barcelona Football Club Foundation to rally support for refugee children. The campaign, called Hashtag Sign and Pass, invites people to digitally sign a football online and then pass it to their friends via social media. By signing the ball, supporters add their name to UNHCR's Hashtag With Refugees petition, calling on governments and fellow citizens to ensure refugees have a safe place to live, receive education, and are able to work. More information online. And today is the International Albinism Awareness Day. Day highlights the plight of persons with albinism who face stigma and discrimination in many countries because of their appearances. In some communities, erroneous beliefs and myths influenced by superstition put the security and lives of persons with albinism at constant risk, these beliefs and myths are centuries old and present, are present in cultural attitudes and practices around the world. More information on the day is available online and in social media by following the hashtag NotGhosts. And the permanent mission of Niger of excuse me, permanent mission of Nicaragua has informed member states that Father Miguel Descoto Brockman the former president of the General Assembly passed away last week. A book of condolences is open for all for signing through Thursday at the mission of Nicaragua. We offer our condolences to Father Descoto's family and friends and to the people and government of Nicaragua. And as advertised in a short while, I'll be joined by Parfait Onanga Nyanga, the head of the UN mission in the Central African Republic. And tomorrow I will be joined by the head of the UN peacekeeping mission in Cote d'Ivoire. Masood. Oh, thank you, Stefan. Um, uh, can, can you tell me in this question about the Gulf, situation in the Gulf? Has the Secretary General been able to wrap his head around the situation and talk to any of the leaders in the Gulf, like Saudi Arabia and so forth? Uh, I have no doubt that he's uh, wrapped around, wrapped his head around uh, the situation. Uh, there have been a number of, of contacts which I will not go into uh, into details, uh, but obviously the, the Secretary General's message of, of regional uni unity and the need uh, for regional unity, especially uh, in the times where we see conflicts in, uh, in Syria and Iraq and other parts of the region, I think is ever more needed. Any, any, any positive outcome of the uh, no, Nothing that I'm able to report. Mr. Abadi, sorry, I didn't see your, your camouflage today. Your, Thank you, Stefan. Your jacket is the same color as the chair. It's not, <laughs> not a good idea. <laughs> the Secretary General observed, as you indicated at the beginning, that uh, terrorist activities were increasing. And he uh, stressed the need for 
smart policies. Mm -hmm. What did he have in mind? Did, did he have any concrete recommendations? I think part of his message, if you look at the, his remarks, is for countries to implement the plan of action uh, on, um, on preventing violent extremism, which was adopted by the General Assembly. And second, I think his main point is that uh, any uh, efforts to fight uh, terrorism, to counter violent extremism uh, that involve the curtailing of human rights, that involve targeting specific communities based on ethnicity and religion, are not smart. Edie. Uh, Steph, we are quickly approaching six months since the Secretary General has been in office. And I wondered what the prospects were for holding his first press conference in this room. I'm well aware of the situation. As soon as I have some positive developments to share with you, I will be oh so delighted to do it. Rosalind, and then Sarah. Steph, there's a report that the uh, UNDP resident representative in Myanmar has been removed from her post. According to one report, it's because she has refused to notify her superiors about the actual human rights situation in Myanmar, particularly in Rakhine State. Do you have any comment on her status? No. Uh, first of all, her status is uh, that she will be... Um, she will be rotating, uh, rotated out. Uh, the typical, um, uh, the typical uh, assignments for uh, resident coordinators are generally three to five years. Uh, Ms. Lok Desilian has been serving in Myanmar. This is her fourth year. Uh, the the post of the resident coordinator uh, in Myanmar, it will be uh, raised to a level of an assistant secretary general to deepen the collaboration between Myanmar and the UN. Uh, the elevation of the post has nothing to do with the performance of the current resident coordinator. Uh, her performance has been constantly uh, appreciated. I mean, as, as you, you were talking about Rakhine, as you know, I think she led a, a mission of uh, humanitarians and, and others to Rakhine State. So I think she has been extremely diligent in reporting back uh, on the situation in Myanmar, including on the situation of human rights. Masood, and then Sarah, sorry, yeah. Yeah, Go ahead. Stefan, I just wanted to ask you this question about incarceration of Palestinian children in Israeli jails. Do we have any update at all as to how many children are in Israeli jails now incarcerated? Uh, I, and, I, yeah, and I do not have those numbers this. with me. I, I would refer you to the probably uh, to the regional officers, either UNSCO or the, the High Commissioner for Human Rights. The figure that is being given is 350. Is it more than that? I, I, as I said, I don't have a number uh, in my head. Sarah. My question was on Myanmar asked and answered. Thanks. OK, excellent. Enjoy the rest of your day. I shall enjoy the rest of my day. Oh, we'll have uh, our guests. I'm sorry. I'm so excited to leave you. I forgot that we have a guest. Not here. Give us uh, give us a few minutes. You should be here any any moment.